Hi, welcome to the Second Rainbow Coalition Reading Group. We are reading The Young Lords by Joanna Fernandez. And today we will be starting with the section Think Lincoln, Think Community. Uh, first, Sister Gabby is going to read the Second Rainbow Coalition Statement of Unity. Gabby, you've got the floor. Thank you so much, sisters. And I'll begin reading the Statement of Unity right now. Let me screen share my screen. Oh, hold up. I'll have to stop my screen share. There you go. Okay, go ahead. Can you all see this? Not yet. Uh, no. Not yet. Y'all can't see this? Mm, that's weird. Uh -huh. Let me uh, let me do it again then. Oh, sorry. Sure, yes. There. Can you all see this? Oh. Uh, okay. Yeah, right on. All right, I will begin reading the same of beauty preface. The U.S. was found as a colonial seller state based upon white supremacy and slavery, stealing the, land, stealing the land of the indigenous nations, breaking every treaty made with them, and confining them to quote-unquote reservations, concentration camps. As the country became more powerful, the ego sunk its claws into other nations, making war on Mexico and grabbing its northern territory, even in Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the Philippines, and either annexing them outright or making them colonies or neo-colonies. And in the 20th century, it became the major imperialist power of the world, exploiting both the people within its boundaries and those in every other country, bullying them with military intervention and robbing them of their right to self-determination. As C.U.P. Newton stated, we have two enemies to fight, racism and capitalism. But between the two, Capitalism is primary. Racism is a byproduct of capitalism. The working people of the world, of every ethnicity or nationality, face a common enemy that is destroying life on Earth. Our enemy is a small ruling is a small ruling class of property owners controlling most of the world's wealth and resources. We must have our basic needs to meet a good and meaningful life: food, shelter, health care, education freedom from the oppression by the state, and peace with other nations. To obtain these essential things for life, we must have the power to see to it that the abundance that's available is shared equitably. Statement of Unity for the Second Rainbow Coalition. The legacy of the First Rainbow Coalition dates back to its founding on April 4th, 1969, by the original Black Panther Party, original Young Lords, and Young Patriots Organization. A number of other organizations joined this coalition not too long afterwards, such as the American Indian Movement, Brown Berets, Rise Up Angry, the Red Guards, and others. Since the founding of the United States, the match has developed a, a number of popular movements that came together to fight back against this capitalist and populist system in various ways or on particular demands. Nevertheless, none has established a movement quite like the First Rainbow Coalition. This historic example was the first of its kind that established a model of class struggle like no other. Its charismatic leader, Chairman Fred Hampton of the Illinois chapter of the original Black Panther Party, stated that at the end of the day, we weren't engaged in a quote-unquote race struggle. He said that's a class struggle, goddammit. By uniting with the various oppressed ethnicities and masses, they were able to bridge the gap between the various ethnic communities that white supremacy had long sought to keep, the, to keep divided. This class solidarity equipped them with the material basis and class consciousness to see their common class condition. Therefore, the necessity to form a united front against their common class oppressor, the capitalist and imperialist ruling class. The ruling class viewed this as the greatest threat to their class rule and subsequently used the entire oppressive forces of the state, police, courts, jails, prisons, intelligence agencies, etc., in order to crush this emerging revolutionary socialist movement. We refounded the Rainbow Coalition on May 14th, 2021, with the intent of upholding the legacy of the original Rainbow Coalition. We believe that this historic example is the model for the United Front that will best serve our class liberation. By upholding the, the template program of the, original Young, of the original Black Panther Party, which was subsequently adopted and later expanded by the original Young Lords, Young Patriots Organization, and all other original Rainbow Coalition members, we establish our pragmatic unity. The six disciplinary rules that we uphold ties all organizations in our coalition to a common professional discipline. History has bestowed upon our generation a common class mission to fulfill. The representatives of the capitalist and peerless ruling class, represented by the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, cannot 
liberate us. It is their class intention and class interest to uphold our common class oppression. Therefore, it is only we, the oppressed masses of all ethnicities and nationalities, who must build the necessary class solidarity, class consciousness, organizational structures, and the united front that will ultimately liberate ourselves. This is what the Second Rainbow Coalition is committed to. This is the historic mission we intend to fulfill. Dare to struggle, dare to win. All members of the coalition, New African Black Panther Party, White Panther Party, Green Party of New Jersey, Poor People's Army, La Mesa Nacional de Brown Berets, Nassau, North Alabama School for Organizers, New Era Young Lords, and American Indian Movement Northeast Woodland Chapter. The six disciplinary rules. Number one, members will conduct themselves in a manner to bring credit to the coalition and will treat others with respect and politeness. Number two, members will be sober when on rainbow coalition business and will not engage in any criminal activity while a member. Number three, no member will engage in violence except in the extremity of self-defense. Number four, members will not gossip nor be divisive to the unity of the second rainbow coalition. Number five, members will not act as informers nor work against the purpose of the Second Rainbow Coalition. And number six, nobody is authorized to speak for the Second Rainbow Coalition unless authorized to do so. And that is a statement of unity. Thank you, comrade. Of course. Go. All right, can everyone see that clearly? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay. Think Lincoln, think community. In the weeks before the Young Lords went to work at Lincoln in the fall of 1970, a more traditional cast of political actors was already at work there. In early April, lo local Puerto Rican political clubs tied to the Democratic Party and community groups held a sit-in in, in the lobby of Lincoln Hospital after the Commissioner of Hospitals refused to support the candidacy for hospital administrator of a well-qualified Puerto Rican gynecologist and public health administrator, Dr. Antero Laco Laca? I don't know, uh, who is trained in Puerto Rico. Their efforts were inspired by Ramon Velez, a political boss and controversial player in local politics, who sought influence over Lincoln, one of the major employers in the South Bronx, especially since the future construction of a new hospital building would yield lucrative contracts. This earned Velez a spot as Palante's Pig of the Week. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Number one Puerto Rican poverty pimp, head of the Hunts Point Multi-Service Center, runs the South Bronx like a little political machine, giving jobs here and there to supporters and destroying anyone who gets in his way. He gets our people to fight Black people for a share of the rotten poverty program pie that shrinks every year. He is head of a $12 million program. Meanwhile, Lincoln Hospital, the schools, the garbage, the buildings, and the police in Hunts Point are no better. The groups affiliated with Velez sought to reform care at Lincoln by demanding that racial and ethnic composition of the hospital's administrative body reflect the racial and ethnic makeup of the community. Yet, given the medical establishment's <laughs> conservative hiring patterns for top administrative posts, even the granting of moderate reforms at the height of the revolution in rights consciousness required substantial social pressure and militant action. In an attempt to quell the furor at Lincoln, the mayor intervened by overruling the commissioner's decision and approving Antero Lacote's appointment. Months later, the New York Times proclaimed, quote, if it were not for militants among the people of the South Bronx, Dr. Antero Lacote might not be administrator of Lincoln Hospital, end quote, referring to the militancy of activists the previous year. Much more radical organizing was still to come. Critical of Velez's group and its ties to the anti-poverty industry and social service oriented community groups competing for funding, the Young Lords sought to influence Lincoln on their own terms. They explored a grassroots organizing approach at the hospital that focused on conditions rather than the scrolling. Oh, yeah, lovely. I, I dig the artwork that was in Palante. <laughs> Same. I love this. I love this. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, the appointment of people to of people of color to administrative positions. Uh, their objective was to address patient needs and grievances, expose malfeasance, impugn the profit-driven system of healthcare, and build their base in the process. In an article in Palante about how to solve the crisis of healthcare among people of color in New York, the Young Lords wrote, quote, the only way we can stop all this is by not electing someone in, or is not by electing someone into office because we have tried that and it does not work. It is not done by going to college and getting doctor degrees because that leads to an intellectual trap that takes us away from our people. And that we also tried. The only way to make this racist government service right is by knocking it down and building a new one of our own. And whoa, all oh, fucking power to that. Uh, in May 1970, in concert with neighborhood residents and hospital workers, among them the talented mental health worker and organizer Cleo Silvers, who became the head of HRUM at Lincoln and then its citywide co-chair alongside Gloria Fontanas, the Young Lords and HRUM launched the Think Lincoln Committee, TLC. <clears throat> One of its goals was to challenge the newly formed citywide governing body for New York's public hospitals, the Health and Hospital Corporation, HHC, and its proposed budget cuts, scheduled for July of that year, which would further deteriorate in an already miserable situation. Run by a 16-member board appointed largely by the mayor, the HHC's stated purpose was to free the public hospital system of bureaucratic red tape in order to facilitate the provision of medical services in New York's underprivileged communities. But like its predecessor, the Department of Hospitals, the HHC was hamstrung by rising healthcare costs and lack of funding. According to HRUM, the HHC is, quote, a group of businessmen to which the city of New York has handed over the mismanagement of its public hospitals. It is representative of the interests of the second most profitable industry in America, the sickness industry that it is, the drug companies, construction firms, medical schools, and the reactionary American Medical Association. Uh, nowhere in this conglomeration are the interests of the colonized people represented, end quote. Galvanized by the hospital's abominable conditions and the immediate threat of budget reductions, the TLC proceeded to gather and spread information about the impact of the impending budget cuts on patients and hospital staff. And I don't know what happened there. Let me fix the screen share. There we go. Okay. Can you all see that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Of all the municipal hospitals facing austerity measures, the already impoverished Lincoln was slated for the steepest cuts. The TLC reported to patients and hospital workers that cuts had precipitated a six month job freeze in the Department of Medicine, which in turn blocked the replacement of five doctors whose services were vital to the functioning of the hospital. The budget redistribution was also expected to limit the operating hours of Section K a screening clinic for patient diagnosis and referral, and increase the number of intakes in the ER, already ranked fourth busiest in the nation, where patients would be rerouted on evenings and weekends when Section K was expected to shut down. In the process of distributing leaflets, posting flyers, and talking to Lincoln workers and community residents about the cutbacks, the radicals were flooded with numerous concerns. For the young lords, many of whom had endured alienating visits to the hospital as children, these complaints were not foreign. These young people had witnessed the stigma and indignity of racial discrimination during hospital visits, long waiting hours in the ER, and the haphazard care of their patients and people like them. As we've seen, their generation functioned as an indispensable language and cultural interpreters for their community, especially in New York's public hospitals which second only to the public schools, were the most frequented of the city's bureaucracies and institutions. It is no surprise that as politically conscious young adults, the young lords were drawn to the hospital that had become ground zero in the city's health crisis. The race and class critique of what became known on the left as the fight against healthcare inequity made sense organically and fueled righteous indignation among these young radicals. 
Conversations with people in the hospital led the Young Lords to set up a patient worker complaint table in the ER to document patients' many grievances. A rotating crew of Young Lords and community members sat at the table from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. on weekdays and around the clock on weekends. Over the course of their first month, they collected 2,000 complaints, the most common being unsanitary health conditions, the language barrier for non-English speaking patients, the failure of doctors to explain medical information to their patients, the backlog created by the scarcity of doctors, one doctor per 80 patients on average, and a five to six hour waiting period in the ER. TLC members championed the rights of patients and workers and often sought to resolve grievances immediately by accompanying patients to the office, floor, or clinic where they had been improperly served. TLC representatives would show up to any of the hospital's floors or departments to address patient grievances. The work of documentation and verification, day after day after day, was unexciting, but the Young Lords were filled with an impassioned commitment to serve. Although brash, their advocacy was not provocative, involved no confrontations with police, and had none of the glorious self-righteous fury that accompanied radical 1960s activism. The hours logged at the complaint table embodied the Young Lord's rapid evolution into a group committed to its community and to helping ease the banal injustices of everyday life. In just a couple of months, the hospital's ethics were transformed by systematizing for the first time a way of documenting and bringing patient grievances into the open, the activists helped establish a code of behavior in the hospital. No other effort had zeroed in on the abominable, uh, abominable <laughs> conditions at Lincoln so methodically. The lay intervention of the activists and the relationship between patient and physician also challenged the rigid hierarchy of an institution founded on paternalism. Patients who were previously treated with condescension, disregard, or contempt by those occupying a higher social status in the hospital hierarchy began to be accorded better and more respectful treatment. Redress of grievances was often procured successfully by discussing the issue with the appropriate staff person and in the presence of the patient. A report on the crisis at Lincoln prepared in August 1970 for the HHC by its chief administrator, Antero Lacotte, confirmed these findings. Describing those who set up the complaint table at Lincoln as, quote, consumers of health care, Lacotte wrote, the watchdog activities of persons strongly committed to good, humanized, and personalized health care created immediate, visible, positive changes. Doctors kept a better working schedule, the, paying, or the waiting period for patients diminished, the traditional long lines in our emergency rooms, outpatient clinics, and the pharmacy became shorter. In response to one of the many complaints it received, the TLC obtained screens for the ER's bathroom cubicles, which had been exposed. When civil discussion failed to obtain desired results, the TLC adopted more confrontational strategies. On another occasion, the TLC's request that garbage be removed from the corner of 142nd Street and Cortland Avenue, just outside the hospital, was finally granted, but only after the group, inspired by the Young Lord's sanitation protests, transferred a heap of garbage from the street into Lacotte's office. According to the TLC, the garbage protest was an action of last resort. <clears throat> well, we complained, we petitioned, we called the mayor's office, and nothing was done, end quote. Although the TLC was primarily involved with issues concerning patient treatment, it also rallied around improved working conditions. Following the involvement of the TLC, cafeteria workers who had long complained of the 90 degree heat in the hospital's unventilated kitchen were finally provided the fan they had requested a long time before. In spring and early summer 1970, the coalition established a set of demands that reflected the concerns of a community controlled movement and to a lesser extent, the traditional demands that a union might present at a contract negotiation. The TLC declared, number one, doctors must give humane treatment to patients. Number two, 
Free food must be given to patients who spend hours in the hospital waiting to be seen. Number three, construction on the new Lincoln Hospital must start immediately. Number four, there must be no cutbacks in services or in jobs in any part of Lincoln Hospital. Number five, the immediate formation of a community worker board which has control over the policies and the practices of the hospital. These demands were in the spirit of those made by the mental health workers a year earlier, but were more explicit about poor hospital conditions and in their demands that doctors live up to the highest ethics of their profession. Initial successes soon stalled. The TLC's declaration was accepted graciously by the administration in June, but not much happened. These first three months of intense organizing yielded limited results beyond improved patient relations. A victory for sure, but one that only made the activists aware of how much more they could accomplish. Starting in July, acting independently of the TLC, the Young Lords turned to more militant action, which they believed would jolt the hospital administration and city government into conceding greater reforms. The Young Lords acted on their own because their action would require clandestine planning and a chain of command that they believed could only be carried out by a disciplined cadre organization. Their plans for more dramatic protests coincided with the arrival on July 1st, 1970, excuse me, of 31 medical interns and residents who had applied collectively to complete their residencies at Lincoln. This progressive group of young men and women chose Lincoln because they were looking to build a community-centered residency program and for a less traditional learning environment. According to one of the residents, Dr. Harold Osborne, quote, after medical school, a group of us got together and we were talking about going together as a group to some place to do our training. Because the training that you participated in, in medicine, internship and residency is very dehumanizing and sort of top down very traditional, very hierarchical, and we wanted to do it in a different way, end quote. Does anybody else want to take a turn reading? I'd like to read it, if that's okay. Okay, go for it, Cameron. All right, let me just get comfortable. Okay. Um, the project was anchored by... Um, by four progressive doctors in training at Jacoby Hospital in the Bronx who were entering their third year of residency. Um, Charlotte Fine, David, David Stead, um, Fitzhugh Mullen, and Marty Stein. They chose Lincoln Hospital in part because of its history of activism, but also because there, there was a power vacuum there. With a lack of resources and staff, it was a kind of medical Siberia. According to Mullen, Lincoln, quote, didn't have a lot of senior staff. If you're going to try to take over and build a community hospital with a different philosophy, with a different set of relationships, this is a good place to go. As compared to Jacoby or lots of other places that had a million, that had a million invested and well-established interests, unquote. When the second year interns at Jacoby, at Jacoby introduced the idea of recruiting a community-minded cohort of residents to Lincoln's chief of, of pediat ped pediatrics, pediatrics. Dr. Ar oh, right, right, right. <laughs> Dr. Arnold Einhorn, Einhorn, he agreed with the proposal. Since Einhorn's department had long been staffed with foreign doctors, the introduction of an entirely U.S.-trained staff of interns and residents from re reputable schools was expected to increase the, the was expected to increase the prestige of its program. According to Osborne, quote, the thing about Einhorn was that he was kind of an unusual character. He was he was clinic he was clinically a very skillful. Um, um, pediatrician, pediatrician, someone who was pretty well known in, in, in academic circles, well published, but he ran a department like a little, like a little kingdom. He was the king. That doesn't fucking surprise me. <laughs> and he had th these residents who were mostly foreign, particularly Filipino or Asian, who never questioned him and kind of hung on his every word and really thought he was God. Unquote. Jesus fuck. 
If that is individualistic behavior, I don't know what is. <laughs> right. Snowboard's one on the horizon. The doctors of Lincoln Collective, as they called themselves, were poorly dressed, long-haired, downwardly mobile doctors in training who were looking to, quote, escape the medical training hierarchy they detested, unquote. The doctors came to the South Bronx with a righteous sense of purpose and a belief that healthcare was a humane, was a human right that was too often denied to the poor. According to Osborne, they understood that, quote, medicine and politics were inseparable, unquote. Yep, everything in society is influenced by politics, even the air we breathe. Mullen explained that the goal was to, quote, craft a community-oriented medical training program for interns and residents at a community-oriented hospital, unquote, where the presence of good doctors could save lives. According to Osborne, they envisioned, quote, a training program that was non-hierarchical, pro-patient, and pro-public health care, um, unquote. The doctors saw um, prevention as, as important, if not more important, than medical training. Um, treatment and wanted to involve the workers in the hospital and, and the community in in determining the services and determining what services were made available and what kinds of doctors should work at the hospital. Quote unquote. The collective came with no less of a goal to then quote transform the healthcare of the South Bronx. Unquote. Uh, there are a lot of quotations in this one, <laughs> but from the outset, their dreams were t- or tempered by the high stakes of medical care at Lincoln. Yeah. According to Mullen, quote, whatever our plans were for ramping up our political activities, we were mostly consumed with ramping up our medical activities, getting comfortable being the staff of this very big, very active medical 24-7 institution, unquote. And then within two weeks of their arrival, the doctors were thrust into a into a um, tum- oh, tumultuous, right? Tumultuous battle, tumultuous battle for community control of the hospital. Nice. The occupation of Lincoln Hospital. On the afternoon of July 13th, after a typically long day of carrying out the various daily functions of the organization, speaking engagements, um, leafletting, the selling of Palante and assisting members of the community with translation or advocacy in schools or the welfare office. General body members of the Young Lords checked in as usual at their East Harlem headquarters. Upon arrival, members were given a sheet of paper with instructions that contained the coordinates of a gathering scheduled for the evening. Also included were the names of two or three Young Lords to bring along, but to whom information should not be um, divulged. The leadership was concerned with police infiltration, but among the rank and file, rumor had it that a surprise party was in the works. Ooh, excited. Over the next few hours, approximately 150 young lords gathered at an apartment on Manhattan Avenue. Chairman Felipe Luciano announced that that those present would be occupying Lincoln Hospital the next morning. The leaders of the organization, including Luciano, Juan Gonzalez and David Perez each gave an assessment of the crisis at Lincoln and why the takeover was necessary. Assignments were 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 meted out, and a division of labor was established among different um, subsets of young lords that con- that coincided with the different ministries: health, information, field, education. The rest of the discipline. Der- the rest of the meeting focused on the details of security and the need to comply with strict discipline during the takeover. All of them were expected to sleep in the apartment. Those not r- racked with anxious anticipation managed to sleep a few hours before it was time for, a- for action. At 3.30 a.m. on July 14th, a large U- U-Haul truck and a number of cars were waiting outside the apartment. The only words were instructed to maximize room by making use of the space between their legs for others to crouch in and to hang on tight during the bumpy ride to the South Bronx. At 5 a.m., the the Puerto Rican militant proceeded to reenact a a sensational routine, the same one that had first brought them national, national notoriety 
seven months earlier during their church offensive. With members of HRUM and TLC on call, approximately 200 people were, were gearing up for the action. Members of the Young Lord members of the Young Lord Defense Ministry were on site charged with, quote, neutralizing, unquote, the hospital security as soon as the Young Lord's cavern arrived at the, at the prearranged location. The Defense Ministry was also ready to direct the action. Driven by radical labor organizer William Santiago, father of Young Lord, and there's a picture, ah, sandbags, right on. Hell yeah. Uh, rock salt bags. Let's see. Ah, rock salt bags and nurses' the residence. Oh, oh, that's and why. Makes yeah. sense. Right on. So brought those to to make a uh, makeshift barricade at the side entrance. Hey, whatever works. <laughs> we should use that. How <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know they were prepared? Yep, that's how you knew. Gloria Rodriguez, the U-Haul truck backed into the hospital's loading dock, and when the back doors of the truck were opened, the young lord stormed the hospital. Quote, like a marine storm, a, uh, a beach in war, a, a beachhead in war, unquote. Equipped mainly with chuka sticks, a pair of eight-inch wooden batons held together with an elastic band and used in martial arts, the young lords deployed with confidence and even a measure of grace. Several entered the building wearing long white medical coats, a trademark display of the young lords' mischievous humor and deadly um, earnestness. Immediately after they secured the entrance and exits, they explained their their uh, purpose to those inside and allowed workers and patients access to the building. Within the first hour, the young lords had secured all of the first floor windows, doors, and entrances, blocking them with hospital furniture boxes, with furniture boxes and hundreds of, of industrial-sized bags of, quote, sterling rock salt, unquote, that were in the building. The building's high-pressure water hose was, uh, was unfurled Ooh, something may left. Uh oh. Was unfurled, ready in the event that the police might charge the front entrance of the building. The radicals announced a press conference for 10 a.m. and deployed me messengers to the upper floors to inform doctors, nurses, and other hospital employees of the occupation and request of their assistance in, quote, running the hospital for the people, unquote. Right fucking on. As they did, as they did at the first Spanish United Methodist Church, they kept one door open to ensure that those coming to work were allowed in. Each employee who, who, uh, each each employee was told that the young lords did not wish to, to interfere with the operation of the hospital. At 10 a.m., they explained their action to the press, welcomed volunteers to help staff staff their programs, and invited the community to participate. The timing of the occupation coincided roughly with the onset of the new of the new budgetary cycle when reductions in the hospital services were scheduled to begin. Only days earlier, Palante had run a major article at Lincoln Hospital whose opening lines both reported on the imminent um, budgetary cuts and foreshadowed the young lord's July action. Sorry about that. The, the portentous article began, quote, in July 1970, Lincoln Hospital will be the vic Ooh, Sorry, my screen went black there for a second. OK, on July 1970, Lincoln Hospital will be the, will be the victim of the greedy businessmen who make money from the illness of the of the people of the South Bronx, unquote. <laughs> right on. Though the doctors of the Lincoln Collective were not part of the planning of the action, its logic re resonated with their own understanding of the crisis. They all had read um, Barbera, um, Air and Barbara Ehrenreich. Ehrenreichs, yeah, Barbara Barbara's Ehrenreichs. In Rex's 1970 book, The American Health Empire, on the chaotic nature of the medical system, its organization around profit rather than, than patients, and its traditional hierarchical culture and systemic racist and sexist practices. Practices. The author paid special attention to the, to the, display, to the displacement of solo practitioners by, quote, medical empires, unquote. Defend 
um, defend as a network of institutions um, spearheaded by an elite private medical school and anchored by a by a teaching hospital and in New York, its public hospital affiliates, the medical empire um, accelerated the transformation of healthcare into an industry in the 1960s. Yep, it's not healthcare, it's health business. Even though they were significantly sub sub subsidized by public taxes, the empires focused exclusively on research, the pursuit uh, of prestige, the training of physicians, and the expansion of their real estate holdings through um, insertion in their surrounding um, urban ghettos. Because, because they were powerful enough to set industry standards, they presented a formidable, a formidable obstacle to patient-centered care and a drain on the public um, coffers. I don't know what that means. With help, with the help of HRUM and TLC, the militants began institution institute instituting their community programs. In the auditorium, they began a provisional screening clinic for anemia, lead poisoning, iron deficiency, and tuberculosis. And the basement to create a daycare center and a classroom for political and healthcare education. Over the course of the of the over the course of the day, hundreds of community residents who had heard of the takeover and and of the free services made their way through the occupied building or occupied building or stood watch outside amid a sea of armed police officers. Above them, hanging from the windows of the hospital's upper floors, fluttered the Puerto Rican flag and banners that read, "Seize the hospital to serve the people. Welcome to the People's Hospital." And of course, and, and correspondingly in Spanish. Bienvenidos al hospital de a has, a hospital de uh, oh, sorry de, de pueblo. According to a firsthand account by one of the doctors at the Lincoln Collective, the Lords never formed the Lords never never requested formal backing in advance since um since since to do so would have jeopardized the security surrounding the, the planned action in a likelihood. Though they centered on a fair amount of support of support from the hospital staff, and they got it. The collective members visit the occupied areas frequently, helped staff the daycare and healthcare programs, and let in known and let in and let it be known to the press that the police and police that physicians backed the lords. I, for one, couldn't stay away. The nurses' re residents suddenly had the fantastic, intoxicating air of a liberated zone. <laughs> right on. The press was listening. The city was listening, and the lords had had risen up and were telling the stories of the women and children waiting endlessly in the clinic, the old folks dying of lack of of cardiac care unit, the humili the humiliation of the emergency room, the flies, the pain, the degradation. It felt good. It felt right. It felt righteous. It it was why we had come to Lincoln. That's fucking beautiful. Right. Ugh, sorry. For the duration of the day, radio and, televi and television news broad um, broadcast reported on the group's dramatic um, disruption, capturing the process, the inhumane physical conditions under which service was custom customarily rendered at the hospital. At a press conference, the group's representatives described the hospital's de deplorable conditions in detail. Even Lacotte, the hospital's chief administrator admitted that that the day admitted that they that although he preferred that they leave the young lord's actions were quote quote unquote helpful to quote unquote dr dramatize a, a situation which which is critical <clears throat> that's a, that's how you know things are fucked when even the fucking when even uh the head the chief administrator agrees with them <laughs> right uh, for a city government that was planning to implement a long-term package of austerity me uh, measures in public services, the events at Lincoln Hospital would have consequences. And in no uncertain terms, the Young Lord's actions inserted the budget cutting and its consequences into the city's public discourse. With confidence in their sales, the Young Lord's outlined a new and more co comprehensive set of demands at their press conference. Sorry about that. Uh. 
Sorry. One, no cutbacks in services or jobs, specifically in, in the Section K screening clinic, the emergency room, or translators, doctors, or any other um, personnel. Two, we want immediate funds for the for the NYC health health services administration to complete the building of and fully staff the new Lincoln's hospital. Three, door-to-door -door health services for, for, pre for, for preventative care, emphasizing environmental and sanitation control, environment and sanitation, and sanitation control, nutrition, drug addiction, maternal and, and child care, and senior citizen services. Four, we want a permanent 24 hours our day grievance table staffed by patients and workers with the power to address to re to to redress grievances. Five, we want a a fourteen thousand. Oh, sorry. We want a a one a one a one hundred four hundred. We want a one hundred forty um dollar a week minimum wage for all workers. Six, we want a daycare center for patients and workers at Lincoln Hospital. And seven, we want self determination for all healthcare services through a community worker board to operate Lincoln Hospital. The group of people must have shown their commitment to sincerely serve the people of this um, community. As the political and economic character of these demands suggest, the preoccupations of the of the TLC had, had evolved from an initial focus on humane treatment of patients to demands that also reflected a stronger set of traditional shop floor concerns. The Young Lord's disruptive protest had proved effective once again. As before, feared that a prolonged and hostile conflict would spark a similar actions by um by other by other discontented groups of uh, afforded the Lords a measure of bargaining power in city in city politics. Following their press conference, the militants entered into negotiations with with Lacotte, the mayor's chief assistant, Stid Davidoff, and representative from the HHC, HHC, which had taken over the administrative and allocation of ex expenditures for municipal hospitals a year earlier. After four hours of talk, after four hours of talks, the fragile balance at the at the bargaining table was suddenly upset, just as the agreement was go uh, just as the agreement was about to be reached. According to the Young Lords Party, the police were going to to withdraw their forces from the hospital surrounding area and would have allowed the group to run a series of programs in the hospital in return for the immediate evacuation of the premises. But when, TL, but when TLC delegates received word that an undercover police officer had tried to break through the central um, checkpoint door where a young lord was, was positioned, they called off the negotiations, concluding that, quote, it was, it was apparent that the administration, uh, that the administration had no control of what was going on and the mayor and that Mayor Lindsay, Lindsay, um, through his, his mouth, through his mouthpieces, was trying to double deal. Unquote. Not surprising at all. They're fucking individualistic shitheads. <laughs> at approximately five p.m. and at, at, at approximately five p.m. in an auditorium brimming with media and supporters, young Lord Pablo Guzman reported on what had 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 transpired at the negotiation table. <clears throat> As he spoke, police reinforcements positioned themselves at every entrance of the building. Guzman, Guzman exhorted the audience to defend the hospital, but Guzman's exhortions were merely a ploy to, to disorient the police. Believing they had, quote, won a political victory, unquote, and, they, and, that, they, and that they risked a bloody confrontation with the winning op officers, the Lords decided against mass arrests. As the young, as the young radical um, exited, ex as the young radical excited the audience with his speech, the young lords in their white, in their white smocks began to slip out of the building. A few at a time, um, a few at a, a few at a time, um, 
escorted by resident doctors. After the 12 hours, the occupation of Lincoln Hospital um, ended, just as just as selfly as it began. Supporters stayed in the uh, in the auditorium for several hours so that the young lords could exit without being detected. Only two were arrested. Right on. Um, if someone else wants to read, they can. Unless we stop here. That's, that's actually the end of the section that we are reading today. So right on. I, I, I didn't. Darn. I didn't. Mean, I didn't mean. I didn't mean to to, to read it at all. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, shit happens. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was awesome! I fucking love that. Like, it's really amazing seeing seeing how seeing how how every time they do it, they they perfect um they per they um they per um they they perfect their 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 procedure in organizing and occupying places of political economic and social power you know it's really amazing and and um and once again uh, and once again th um th th this this just shows that the young lords know how to radicalize the people and how to provide for them because they know where the materialistic conditions and needs of the people are at they know what what the people and the masses need they know they um they know what they know because be, because they actually engage in struggling alongside the people they engage in um in um in um in actually investigating and being among the masses you know they actually implement they actually implement mass line to um to provide to provide for the masses so this 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 this, this is just another example of how the young lords are able to meet the people where they're at and, and, and how they effectively re radicalize and revolutionize and organize the masses through struggle alongside them. It's, it's fucking awesome. Right. right. They didn't do the liberal thing of going, well, we did one thing. That problem is solved now. Let's ignore right. it. No, they kept Go coming vote. back Go to vote. keep <laughs> motherfuckers on their toes and make on sure the like you know okay there's still shit that needs to be resolved okay let's address the next shit that needs to be resolved here at the hospital you know exactly and like um and unlike liberals um and unlike liberals the young the, the young lords the young lords don't fucking um don't don't tell people to disarm themselves they, they don't fucking uh um, they, they don't believe it. They don't. They don't believe in that whole guns are inherently fucking evil bullshit that that liberals um try and spew. Guns, just as um, guns, just as the state, just as institutions are not inherently reactionary. It just depends on on who the on who the institutions serve, uh, and, and who they're matched by. Do, are they are are they um are they, are they supported? And and cater to the bourgeois, or are they supported, managed, and catered to the proletariat? That's what determines whether or not they're revolutionary, or whether or not they're uh, uh, they're reactionary. And just like and just like the gun, if it's led, managed, and controlled by the people for liberation, it's revolutionary. You know, right? right. And well, even in this instance, they had people show up with what did they call them? Chuko sticks for martial yeah. arts yeah. of like exactly. okay that. That was being armed in a manner where it's like, okay, if some shit pops off, they can defend themselves and others around them without worrying about friendly fire in about a very not. extremely crowded hospital, you know? Right. Um, Joe, I see you exactly. got your hand up. Go ahead, comrade. Uh, yes, and, and first, uh, let me start off with saying hello. Our greetings, revolutionary comrades. Uh, well, but a couple... Oh, a couple couple of the things that stood out to me in this um, where they had the support of the doctors and uh, the interns and even I guess the chief of staff or the, the administrator there how they even got the support of the doctors and stuff and then they were escorting them out I thought that was pretty powerful and then they were leaving like two at a time like ducking away and only two got arrested out of all the ones that were there uh, but what, what was another thing that I really liked is where they put the, I think they're about 90 pound sacks of salt rock as barricades on that back door. And then on the front door, they had one of those water, high pressure water hoses that you'll find in, in hospitals. 
um, aimed at the front doors just in case the cops rushed in. They were going to be uh, backed up by that because that water hose is powerful. Uh, so I thought that was pretty pretty cool tactics. But the support of the doctors and stuff like that and the community even came out and supported and were watching the cops out in the front. Like, man, the impact that they had, that was that was really nice. That's all I have to say. I agree. I found that pretty remarkable, too, that there was a group of doctors that, uh, you know, were against the hierarchy as well. And they're like, fuck this. We're teaming up with the activists. I dig that. Um, OK, I see we got a few hands up. Uh, Shanti had raised her hand first, then Gabby and then Comrade Shay. Go ahead, Shanti. All right. This takeover is Revolution 101 on how to organize. This is how you organize, okay? They did not have to use guns. They did not have to be the weather underground for shit. One thing about youth, we're not stupid. The fact that Mayor Lindsay tried to infiltrate the whole takeover with that undercover officer that tried to sneak in and the fact that the, and the, fact that the young lords, young people, you, children, did not fall for it. That shows you just how powerful it was because they did not have to be all extra and be all adventurous to literally make the public listen to them, to young people, to what was actually going on in that hospital, to the community. You know what I'm saying? Um, and the fact that uh, they tried to uh, literally do budgetary cuts but up to uh, uh, around where uh, when the takeover happened you know that foreshadowed everything you know not only for young lords but also uh, for the community around the hospital you know um, the fact that it was the youth that did this they knew how to organize at this point that was essentially uh, the New York chapter at their peak, because now uh, that uh, plight of organizing has now been largely grounded and they knew how uh, to set up, you know, their usual program, uh, especially in the hospital with the political education uh, classes and uh, their uh, health clinic, you know, in the freaking auditorium. You know, that, like, that is how you organize. You don't have to use guns. You don't have to be adventurous. You don't have to, you know, put your community at risk in order to make an impact like that. And the fact that they were able to pull that takeover off with very little to no problem, with solidarity from the doctors, helping with the doctors, the doctors helping them, uh, helping them uh, leave uh, safely, you know, so that there's no problem. That is what community is. Yeah. That is a textbook example of what community is. That's what happens when you come back into reality and actually show up for other people within your community. That is the textbook example. The takeover is a, is a textbook uh, example of a properly organized, event none of this adventurous shit once again they didn't have to do any of that they didn't have to you know have guns with them they used they they got creative that's what you're that's what you're supposed to do meet the people where they're at and be creative that way they used uh salt uh salt rock bags heavy heavy salt rock bags um and a tool used uh, uh, that could be used as uh, in martial arts, you know, that is what they were able to do with no problem, no problem whatsoever. Only two people were arrested. So, you know, whatever. But the fact that they were still able to pull this off with no qualms about it, once again, shows one, to be in your, to be in reality and be with your community and two, how to organize without having to be on weather underground type shit. Once again, they did not have to do that. 
Yep. Look and- at look at what happened with the takeover. Look at what happened with the takeover. Once again, they got the public's attention once and for all. And they were able to leave a mark, to leave a mark on everyone. Not only the not only the doctors, but everyone in the community that was around because they needed, they needed that kind of spark. They needed a group of people to be able to take over and put their boots on the ground to help, you know, with the hospital. Because if the takeover didn't happen, there will be no Lincoln Hospital. There would have been no Lincoln Hospital. There would have, it, it wouldn't have stayed. So the fact well, that they were able to pull it off, like, that's the textbook example there. Going back to what you were saying a moment ago about meeting people where they're at is how this all started because the hospital itself was lacking in having a fucking complaint department for people to even go, hey, there's something wrong here with how I'm being treated in this hospital. And they set up that table themselves to address that and go, okay, what shit are you dealing with here and how can we help you with it? And started with escorting the patients into their appointments to make sure that shit was being handled properly after receiving these complaints and when that was not enough to resolve it then decided to do another takeover of the hospital this was in direct response to the community voicing these are our needs let's address this together right that's how you do it the right way yep comrade gabby yeah, I wanted to touch on something um, right on, Kamal Shanti, right, right on. I wanted to touch on what you said about about this is how you radicalize people that you don't need to go fucking, um, fucking um, blowing up, um, 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 uh, th- um, sh- um, shooting up pigs and fucking blowing them up in order to be a, re- a, re- um, a revolutionary like the un- like 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 the weather underground because so many people think. Right, that being a revolutionary means oh, you, oh, you take up a gun, you you take you take you take, up, you take up a gun and you go to a fucking police station and you, and you fucking shoot up a, a bunch of people. Like, like, no, that's not what being a revolutionary means. That that's not what it means to be a revolutionary. Because at the end of the day, being a revolutionary means means um it, it, it means solving the problems within your community. That's what it means. It means providing for and meeting the people where where they are at. It's not mean carrying um carrying around guns and being extra. It's not it it's not mean being adventuristic or um or or, or or accelerationist or commandist. If you provide for the masses of any way, if you heighten the contradictions be- between the proletariat and the bourgeois, if you in any way are building dual dual power and self-determination within your community, you're a revolutionary. If you provide medical care for your community, you're a revolutionary. If you're educating the youth and the people and the masses and teaching them an actual, the actual truth of history and showing them and teaching them um, to, 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 view, to, to view society and to view our world in a principled, scientific, and dialectical manner, you're a revolutionary. Even if you've never touched a gun, even if you've never carried a gun in your life before, if you are building survival programs, if you are meeting the masses where they're at, if you are engaging and radicalizing the masses, you are a revolutionary because you because because, because, because you engaging in um, because you engaging in these survival programs will lead to, to, to their militancy. It will lead to, to them eventually saying, hey. You know what? Why the fuck is everything fucked up? Why 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 are things like this? Are um um isn't the system supposed to quote unquote work for us? Why is it not working for us? You educate them or lead them to be militant without even you carrying a gun ever. That's what it means, you know. Well, the purpose in carrying a gun or any other weapon is for self defense. Self defense, exactly. Uh, exactly. Offense. And therein lies the difference between their tactics and 
you know, situations like what happened with the Weather Underground is, you know, they they merely had themselves armed in case some shit popped off and they needed to protect themselves or others around them at the hospital. They didn't go in there like, you know, uh, brandishing their weapons going, you know, we're, we're taking this shit over violently. No, it was just, hey, I have this to back me up just in case. And that's one reason why we absolutely emphasize like, violence only being necessary if you absolutely have to defend yourself against violence being exacted against you Mm -hmm. you know it has a time and place you know and yes it's a damn good thing to be trained and to be armed because that is essential for your fucking self-defense but it's not necessary to come in guns blazing that that is in in contradiction to actually I, achieve goals if you're coming into a place where you're expecting proper health care to be provided and being like we're we're gonna demand this at gunpoint you know <laughs> that, that's not the point the of, people. of arming yourself them. exactly right, right. Oh, exactly that, there's yeah, a time think, in place uh sorry oh i think those um those cello sticks also can be carried uh, in, in your back, in your, you know, uh, with yeah. and held in with your belt and your tactical pants. Um, yep. So, so it's not like you're actually carrying them, um, but you can get pull them out as needed. Uh, so it's not a forcible threat. It's just another tool that's actually legal, just like a a, a, a knife on the side of your belt is legal. Exactly. A is legal. A taser is legal. There's a, uh, yeah, well, I don't know. In different states, they have different uh, laws, but just wanted to say that. I know Comrade Shea wanted to say something, so let me be quiet. <laughs> right on. Yeah, but let me say this. In New York State, new chops are illegal. They're considered weapons. You know, nevertheless, like the Comrade Shanté was, say, Shanté was say, talking about, not all struggles entail weapons. Some some struggles entail man mass organizing, you know. And if it wasn't for the masses that came forth and, and supported the young laws, they probably wouldn't have been successful in that struggle. Just remember, just like in the People's Church on Hundred and Twelfth Street, Lexington Avenue, you know, I've been there so many times. It's crazy, and. Uh, there was mass organizing there too. And the people came, people supported supported us on that struggle. So it's a it's a matter of how it's a matter of principle and, and organizing and determining what kind of struggle is needed for the for the masses on that particular occasion. You know, and the the, the hospital struggle wasn't on, it wasn't necessary for any violence. You know, because the doctors themselves, the nurses themselves, as a matter of fact, Cleo Silvers, she worked in that hospital and she gave up her job and joined the Young Laws. You see, so it, it, it's, it, it's, how you, it's how you wage the struggle that determines the outcome. And um, it was a good outcome, man, because later on they built a new, uh, they built a new uh, hospital, you know, a new hospital and, and uh, and everything went okay. That's all I have to say for now. Right on. Thank you, comrade. Uh, Joe, I see you popped your hand up. Uh, yeah, and I was gonna just say one more thing. Um, I think the most powerful weapon we have is education uh, and through our tongue. Uh, and that's the most powerful weapon we have. So we don't need to, I mean, carry weapons. I've, I mean, I always have something to protect myself. I've done that since I was a kid. And like you said, it's for self def- self-protection, self not, you know, to antagonize someone. So when we do carry stuff, it um, should be nice, neat, and tucked away and, and, and visible. And like, that's what I said, different states have different laws of what you can get away with. I think they just passed in New Mexico this past week where they are banning uh, carry and conceal. Uh, really where, where it was legal and in new mexico like they're really breaking down on 
on the gun laws over there. They're, they're talking about, well, I, got, I have to talk some more to the comrades out there, but we're probably going to make a, some kind of stance against that because that's some bullshit. Anyway, God, I, I believe that people have the right to carry their weapons, but we don't always need to carry a weapon. We need more diffusers and speakers than we do uh, uh, sharpshooters. That's all. Agreed. And, like, honestly, the fact of the matter is, like, regardless of what state you're in, it should be legal to either open carry or concealed carry and have that be your choice. That's just my personal opinion on it. Um, I grew up in an open carry state. I currently live in an open carry state. Um, and, you know, to me, that's something that is essential just in case you need it for your own self-defense because you never know what the fuck's going to pop off. Oh, um, I, I was going to say, I think they they, they stopped that uh, open, open carry also. So not just the concealed, but the open carry. Um, you might want to look into that, comrade, because we're going to, the Brown Beret is going to try to do something out there for that. It's in the planning stages. Definitely let me know. And uh, I've got a comrade in New Mexico I'm going to touch base with and see what's up. He's a gun aficionado. And uh, I'm going to have to pick his brain on that and see what he's been able to find out about that, too. Yeah, and if you, if you can get any any information uh, and, and relate that to me, because I, when I am talking to the people, I know what the hell I'm talking about. Because I know this, that happened this, this week, I believe this week, or within the, within the seven-day period. That's all. Okay. I'll let you know as soon as I'm able to touch base with him and find anything out. Um, go ahead, Comrade Gabby. So you got your hand up. Right on, right on. Um, oh, yeah. Um, basically what everyone was saying, you know, and and, and what Comrade Che was saying. How um how um how, how the reason why how the reason why that occupation even succeeded in the first place was because of the mass support that the young lords had, and that's how you know that the young lords were doing something right. Because if they came in guns blazing, carrying um ca um carrying um um semi-automatic rifles in there, you bet that no one would have taken them seriously, or if they did, or if they did take them seriously, it wouldn't have been out of respect. And admiration will have been out of fear, you know, and that's the last thing you want. The last thing you want is um is for the masses to fear you. The last thing you want um is to make the materialistic conditions worse for people. That's the last thing you want, and that and that's and, and that's and and that's what the and, and that's what groups like and that's what groups like like the underground um like the weather underground do. They're accelerationists. They think that um, they think that making the materialistic conditions worse for people, they think that making the materialistic, they, they think that um, that going in guns blazing and going on the offensive and so on and so forth is going to make, make things better, when in actuality they're just demonizing and further ostracizing the people that they claim to support. You know? Putting their at risk. Exactly. P putting their very lives at risk. That's not what what he's supposed to do. That's not what a revolutionary is what supposed want. to do. And what the and what the young lords did in that hospital, they met the people where they at. They, the first thing that they did in in that hospital, they didn't go guns blazing. They didn't um um they didn't do anything drastic. The first thing that they did was 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 gather the ideas of the patient in that hospital. They they um they compiled the complaints that they were receiving. They analyzed the materialistic conditions and needs of the people in that hospital. And when they finally gathered all of the ideas, when they connected and struggled with the people, guess what they did? They provide um, um for they for their needs. They um they provided um for their medical needs. They they provided a place to tell their grievances and they also built a daycare as well as an education um uh a section to teach to educate and radicalize the people there not just on healthcare but um but on politics as well to hide the, um, the contradictions that they make and, and to make them class conscious that's how you meet the people 
because as Huey P. Newton said, um, ideological and political line determines everything in a revolution. You can have you can have all the power behind you. You can have all the guns. You can have all the support you have behind you. But if you do not have the correct ideological and political line, if you do not have the correct analysis, and if you're not principled and disciplined in how to adapt and change and and, and change your analysis um, to your materialistic conditions, your movement's going to fail. It's going to break down and will never go anywhere. It's going to fail. It's but, going to yep. fail. And that's exactly... Yeah. And, you know, that's, 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 this is why education is important. This is why political education is important because with political education, we know how to analyze our conditions and we know how to act accordingly uh, with our uh, material conditions at the time. That is your praxis. the most important thing. Yep, praxis. Your, your praxis has to actually line up with the theory. Your ideology. Yeah, um, and to rewind to what you were saying uh, about the weather underground, I don't think their intention was to make material conditions worse. I think their intention was actually to end government oppression in order to improve the material conditions. But they went about it in a fucking acceleration. Um, well manner they went about it in a volatile manner that didn't end up bringing the result that they wanted if i remember correctly they were doing things like bombing government buildings and shit like that mm -hmm. sure. and you know okay I, I i can understand why they wanted to because these are places where the oppressor is operating out of um, I, I would have to look the stuff up, though, to see if they, you know, did shit properly of making sure that the buildings were empty first, so as to, you know, target the infrastructure without there being collateral damage of lives lost. Um, I, I'd have to look that up. I'm not sure if there was lives lost to those incidents or not, but uh, their praxis didn't line up with the actual intentions that they had there all it did was backfire and get them imprisoned and look what happened know, it's a risk that anybody takes as an activist but they accelerated their own imprisonment and then therefore their inability to actually do proper boots on the ground because you know <laughs> they got locked up look, what, look at what happened mm. like you know fred hampton's assassination you know like all that stuff like that is what happens when you don't, when your theory, when theory and your practice does not line up with each other. Once again, this is why political education is important because you know how to organize properly to make sure that the community is safe and that you're not trying to make things worse, even if you're not actually trying to, you know, being sure that you know what the fuck you're doing. That's essentially what political education is, is knowing how to analyze so you know what the fuck you're doing so that the community does not have more um, lateral damage. You know, exactly. the, you know, we already have enough going on, you know, with the Stop Cop City movement and, you know, uh, climate change events and, COVID and all that stuff. So it's already enough going on for everyone. Okay, we don't want to add fuel to the fire, you know, that's already been ignited, you know, since, you know, the beginning of this empire. So like meeting people where they're at, but knowing how to actually do it, that's very, very, very crucial. Not only uh, for young, for uh, not only uh, for uh, older people, but especially uh, for children and youth, because once again, this is the youth that we're talking about. It was the youth that took over that hospital, uh, but they knew how to organize. They actually uh, went into the community, they actually analyzed their uh, conditions, and they figure out, okay, what do we do without, you know, having to, you know, do, su do a suicide mission? You know, that is how you know what the hell you're doing, and that's exactly... Um, uh, what we need is very important. Right. 
Agreed. Uh, Joe, I see you popped your hand up. Yeah, this is another thing that happened um, uh, recently, too, and I brought it up or was brought up yesterday, too. And I, I brought it up yesterday on a, on one of our other study groups. Uh, but uh, Leonard Peltier's birthday, I believe, was Tuesday. He turned 79. And there was they had a protest out there in front of the White House for him. And uh, 22 were arrested. And they were yeah, on the sidewalk. I saw that. Yeah, they were on the sidewalk and they were like uh, doing everything accordingly, and they were listening. And uh, that 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 goes to show, like we I mean, we can plan out things and stuff like that. And I I, I kind of saying this too because I said, well, only two got arrested, but you know, two is too many, so I shouldn't have just like made light of the two that did get arrested. And hopefully, everything went well for them. I'm sure they had the support of the public. That's for sure and of the hospital so it couldn't have been that bad but uh yeah it's, it's just hard when you when you're doing rallies and marches and, and and standing up for something that you know is right um the repercussions that we could face uh, when we're actually doing that and like the comrade shanti was saying uh you know political education is a re is really vital and that's what they opened up on the bottom of that hospital uh, not only a daycare for the workers and stuff, and maybe even for the visitors, I'm not sure, uh, but also a uh, political education cl uh, class section, or you know, in the basement. I was like, wow, what a what a perfect utilization of that space. That that's all. Thank you. Oh, free Leonard Peltier. <laughs> oh yeah, free Leonard. <laughs> It's about time they cut him loose, especially when they couldn't even uh, prove that he did the shooting that they convicted him for. The FBI has fully acknowledged and admitted that they don't know who the fuck shot their agents who actually came in there and started the shooting and were trying to commit a massacre and got shot back at, you know. Um, yeah, he, he's, he's in prison for aiding and abating. Um, so he's not in, in, in prison for actually shooting them. But who did he aid and abate? Because the other two co-defendants um, were um, released because they uh, were found that they were uh, self-protecting themselves. Uh, I forget the term of that. But the, So his two co-defendants was, was of uh, self-protecting yourself and he was arrested for aiding and abate and abating, but who did he aid and abate? You know what I mean? There's no, there's nobody there for that. So that's, that's another sucky ass thing. But right. anyway, when it was clearly an act of self defense on the part of whoever shot him, yes. there is no crime being committed there by them. The only crime being committed there was by those two FBI agents that came in shooting houses up. <laughs> So, yes. if there's no crime, what the fuck are you aiding and abetting? Yeah, so that's why I thought it was so wonderful to hear how they were able to take over the Lincoln Hospital uh, without any too bad of a repercussion. I, I, I mean, like, that's some powerful shit right there. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> that's, 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 that's like, ooh, man, it, it inspires you to like, hey, to think. Right. What, what, if we continue thinking and, like, we continue learning um damn there's probably no end to what we could do and that's all right on right on fucking awesome um and you know as is said in the um <clears throat> in a chapter um the um the, the occupation ended um selfly ended as quickly as it began you know but even the even if the occupation ended um fairly quickly compared to the other occupations even if um um, e um even if they quote unquote technically lost they may have they may have had one step back but they had three steps forward you know because even, because even though that occupation lost they raised the consciousness of the masses you know they politically educated them and showed them how things can be better and had and had them actually question why 
um, why were there needs not being provided for when when we when we literally have everything, um, when we literally have everything, um, that sorry when we literally have everything, um, to provide for us a decent and meaningful way of living. You know, we do is not. It's not a lack of resources. This is a resource problem. This is a socioeconomic problem. We have everything we need. We have more food than human beings alive right now. There are right. there are there are houses. There are enough houses in the U.S. to house every single homeless person, and we'd still have more. Literally, we have access to clean. Water, but what's the problem? Commodification and privatization. Bourgeois system, the bourgeois class. Yes, making problem. things more expensive. This system problem. is a problem, and and how do we make this system? Um, uh, um, and and how do we make this system provide for ourselves? We uproot it and replace it. That's what we do. We uproot it and replace it with a new system led by us, the people, the proletariat, the workers. That's what we do. So yeah, with principle, with, with principle. principle and discipline and sci and scientific keyword analysis, keywords, mm -hmm. keywords, people. <laughs> right. So the fact of the matter is, is there's never been a shortage of any of those resources. There's only ever been a shortage of poor people not having enough money to buy said food or to buy a home, etc. It. it <laughs> That comes down to wages not being fucking high enough because the bourgeoisie is stealing too fucking much from the people actually doing the labor and producing the wealth and labor value. Uh, right. Brad, Joe, I see you got your hand up. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to point on is on the resources. Uh, they were asking at that time $140 a week minimum at that time, right? But then you made a good point right there. This is one other thing that was was brought up last night. Also, is uh, that not all of us own homes. Not all of us have thirty thousand dollars in the bank. Because if we get arrested and our bond is three hundred thousand, we're gonna stay there. You <laughs> so we don't all. I mean, so like they, I helped my my ex wife write this uh, thing for college. Um, where the poor go to jail and the rich go free. And it's so serious, it's serious like that. So I guess that, that kind of determines how much, how serious you want to get into things too, because we are a lot of times facing arrest. Right. And, 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 and if we don't have a house or somebody owns a house that's got, that will vouch for us um, in jail, we will sit until... They, 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 well, I don't know, till, till it gets figured out. And that could be a while. That's all. But this doesn't right. mean that's not going to stop us from doing what we do. Uh, but it's one thing we have to take into consideration. That is right. it. Right. And we have to actually plan for it accordingly and appropriately. Um, prime example being like what the the people are dealing with right now who got arrested for the cop city protests they've literally had rico charges brought against them for shit like monetary contributions for the purpose of buying camping gear for the folks who were on the ground there and now the people who sent donations like here's some money for some camping gear and for some cooking fuel etc are being charged with RICO charges for shit. Like, I mean, I, I looked through the, the documents there from the court and it literally lists every little damn thing. Now, RICO charges are supposed to be for organized crime where you're like, you know, making tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of fucking dollars. Not, oh, I sent $23 to this person to go buy some camping fuel. But that's this, the point. Is fucking ridiculous. And so now, on top of facing charges for that, what the fuck are they going to do? These these folks don't have twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars each sitting in the fucking bank to you know put up front for bail. 
Are they going to try to hit other people with RICO charges if they, you know, send donations to contribute to a legal fund to help get people bailed out and help pay for attorneys now too? All of this shit is, it's big brother bullshit of them trying to move the goalposts and yeah. go, oh, well, you know, you bought this person some fucking food for while they were, you know, camping in this forest trying to protect it. So, you know, now you get hit with RICO charges. That's not what that shit was ever intended for. It was intended for bringing down drug racketeering um, organizations, things like that. And it's being fucking exploited and abused by the state. And this is where we need to be wary of what the fuck they're doing because they will try to move those goalposts with any fucking legislation that they can to try to criminalize people for exercising our First Amendment rights. Exactly. Okay. Oh, did, did you call me? Yeah. Oh, right on. Exactly as you were saying. I was going to add to that. Uh, the fact is that 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 what's considered quote unquote legal, lawful, good, evil, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all is all the is all dependent on what society we live in and who and who that society is meant to, to serve. And every single time, and 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 every single time, the U.S. and the state and the bourgeois are at threat of losing their privilege, they always twist the laws. They always do. They always twist. They always move the goalposts. They always do anything and everything to uphold these interests. These laws are not designed for us. They were never designed for us. They were designed for the upper echelons of society. That's who, that's who, who, they, were, who, who they were designed for. And what's considered legal, lawful, good, it all depends on the socioeconomic system that we live in. Because when the bourgeois steal, murder, and rob people of their labor for um w w which is worth a million times more than the, 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 the what they're being given, it's considered um it's considered quote unquote lawful. But when the workers um protest and actually want better living because this is oh no now that's illegal. That's quote unquote unlawful. Now it's fucking bullshit. Um it's what we were reading before with Ojibwa warrior, um, the standoff at, uh, at wounded knee, um, how, um, how the U S military was brought into that. And if I remember correctly, the U S military is, not, yep, exactly. The U S military is not supposed to interfere in domestic affairs. They're not supposed to interfere in that. That's only, um, the, if I remember correctly, the police, are our only men to actually deal with, with with domestic threats, not the fucking military. So yeah, yeah it's, it is illegal to have a standing army or other military force in active duty on United States land. Period. Yep. Across the fucking board, and so they were committing crimes themselves just from even using that as a threat of force before the feds even went in there and started shooting people's homes up and doing shit. Like there was a four-year-old child that got her eye shot out I right through that. the wall of her fucking house by oh, one yeah. of those FBI agents. And it's like, okay, y'all are the real fucking criminals here, not the people you're trying to, you know, bring these laws against and actually fucking exploit. Um, and I see we got a few other hands up. Uh, Sister Shanti, you are next. And then Joe and then Shay. Um, go ahead, Shanti. Um, and to also to also expand on that, you know, they make these so-called laws to suit themselves because they know that they can change it at any time. They know that they are servers of the bourgeois class, so they can change it at any time they want to. It's not rocket science. Um, <clears throat> you know, with uh, with what happened uh, at Wounded Knee, uh, what happened, what's going on with uh, Cop City, they don't care. That's the point. They never did because that's the whole point. They make these so-called laws so that they can bend them at any at any time, any place, because they because it is a bourgeois empire. And uh, back on uh, Cough City, I blame the European American uh, middle class for this. 
I do. Because they, once again, they came down from up north and over west to New Africa, to the so-called Black Mecca, and literally put um, pretty much everyone in it, at, that had any hand in that movement at risk. That's why those 60 people are charged, because they wanted to be opportunists, and they wanted to be saviors, and they wanted to, you know, be adventurous. That's why Torta was killed. Oh. That was why Torta was killed. That was why they put them in that position. Like, there is nothing illegal about crossing state lines to stand in solidarity with other people. And that is one of the other things that's listed on those RICO charges, um, all the way down to uh, them trying to charge them for being anarchists. What is this, the fucking thought police? None of the things they did were illegal. Crossing state lines to go provide some support to the people who live there who have been speaking out against this from the start, that's not illegal. They did not commit a crime there. So, you know, whether whether it's going to be considered adventurous or not, um, it, it still does not support the state actually bringing charges against them for that because it is not fucking illegal to cross state lines and go, no, I'm going to stand in solidarity with these forest protectors. Exactly. And they, and they don't even know, they, they don't even know what anarchism actually is. If they actually listen to colonized people, if they actually looked at what anarchata is, they would know that anarchism is not what they say it is. They think that it's, you know, all destruction, all, you know, advent, you know, adventurous, you know, destruction, you know, against, you know, society. That's not what anarchism is. That is not what anarchism is. But once again, it doesn't matter if they know. It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter if they don't know. The fact of the matter is they can pin any little reason to those people in order to suppress them, in order to infiltrate them, in order to uh, neutralize them and uh, one of my uh, other Af uh, new African comrades, uh, they're a nomad, but they're very, very involved uh, with uh, revolutionary uh, organizing in Atlanta. Um, they they said themselves how uh, the opportunists, uh, which is a, which is a good chunk of them, they have changed uh, the movement's original militant stance and made it to go to city hall. You know, collect all these signatures, you know, you know, collect this, collect that. And they did collect signatures, but once again, they they did not recognize them. And that was the whole point. It doesn't matter how small or, you know, how big you try to, you know, appease to the state to, you know, not destroy Muscogee land. OK, because they already did. The fact of the matter is they can then these uh they can bend legislation to appease to themselves to uh, assert their own dominance because once again they know that they are the ones in power they are the ones that you know commit all the war and all the destruction you know in the name of so-called democracy even though we never had ideas like that before colonization and the creation of modern capitalism. So I don't know what I don't know what what's even up with them about that. But the fact still remains. The fact the fact remains is that once again it doesn't matter if you cross uh, another uh, arbitrarily bordered uh, piece of native land. It doesn't matter how much money you spend, even uh, how much money you send. Uh, for uh, basic gear to help with the uh, folks on the ground, even if even as little as one dollar, they don't care. The the fact of the matter is that this is the U.S. with the team up, and they have nothing to lose. So they will come up with any reason whatsoever and use whatever tools of the bourgeoisie, uh, whether it's uh, the police, whether it's the military, um, you know their uh, scapegoats that they have um, that they have taken, you know, uh, from the ghetto and actually put them into war, leaving them permanently uh, disabled and uh, mentally, psychologically uh, destroyed. Um, essentially, um, mumpins. 
because they're sense because that's essentially what they are, especially with wounded knee. They use those veterans as scapegoats to literally suppress uh, what they were uh, what they were doing. Once again, veterans aren't protected either, even when they are uh, recruited, you know, from uh, the deepest parts of the ghetto to uh, the most rumping parts of uh, this land within these borders, you know, once again, they're, they are scapegoats of the bourgeoisie and they will discard them uh, once they've got um, enough humanity sucked out of them. You know, what happened with Vietnam? What happened with the Korea War? What happened um, with uh, the First and Second World War? You know, they will discard these people and use them as literal scapegoats to literally infiltrate and suppress um, the folks on the ground. So once again, this is what we have to be mindful about because now everyone is a target. And we've been saying this for a few years since COVID began, that everyone is a target. It, even the privileged, it doesn't matter. Everyone is a target because once again, the boardwalk class has nothing to lose and they are asserting their dominance like nothing before, even like more than uh, COINTELPRO because that was just only uh, the first part of the iceberg. What has been going on since uh, uh, COVID began, especially like that is a sign. And that sign is that no one is safe. No one is protected, even, even if you have the most social, uh, political and economic privilege um, in, in the context of uh, the capitalist system. Um, no one is protected, no one is safe. Anyone can be used as a scapegoat. Anyone can be a disposable uh, whenever uh, they're done uh, using you and literally just make you just like everyone else because that's the point. And once again, this is something that we do need to be uh, mindful about because they have nothing to lose. Absolutely correct. You bring up a valid point there with not even vets being safe. Just going back to that example of wounded knee, Dennis Banks himself was a vet. He served many years. He fought in war. He was in active duty for many years. And he was one of the most hunted activists after returning to the States and actually getting involved, getting involved in trying to protect his community there. It's a prime example of that. Um, I've got to step away for just a moment, but uh, Joe, you have the mic next, and then Comrade Shea, and then Comrade Gabby. I will be right back. <laughs> Go ahead, Comrade Joe. Right on. Okay. Um, a couple of the things that I, I was picking up on. Uh, what happened over there in Cop City and uh, protesters getting arrested and getting faced with... Uh, RICO charges, um, it's a damn dirty shame for people. Uh, and then for, for just donations of people helping out for just basic living supplies, food and shelter. And then uh, it kind of gave me a reflection of our comrade brothers and sisters up in Cap Morgan, up in Manitoba, Canada, at the landfill uh, where they're surviving off of donations. They've been surviving off of donations. Um, so that that's a shame. Another thing I wanted to bring out is uh, what Abbott's doing in Texas. And actually, when we brought up earlier, the, milita the military, where they brought in the military at uh, uh, Wounded Knee or Pine Ridge Reservation, uh, they're bringing the military down to the south of Texas at the border. And what they're doing is inhumane. Uh, to the peoples, uh, which are migratory peoples. Um, and that someone had mentioned yesterday on a study group, uh, they were studying the Geneva Convention. I guess there was four meetings. On the fourth meeting was for uh, humanitarian rights. And what they're doing is uh, inhumane to those that are migrating. And uh, so there's got to be attention drawn to that uh, because, you you know, he had mentioned about the wounded knee. And I was like, 
Well, that's tying into what's happening this week or th these last few weeks up out in Texas. Or the last couple months, should I say. But now they're bringing in military uh, to the border. And that's a direct no-no uh, according to the Geneva Convention. The United States is, or United Snakes are breaking all the freaking rules over there in Texas. And that son of a bitch Abbott is, uh, I don't know who. Well, anyway, I don't want to say too much on the on our live recording, but I, there was something else I had to say, but I forgot about it. But I, Che, you you had to say something, Karna. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I want I want to say this: that throughout history, we have noticed that whenever the United States is 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 in need, they will always bring in the military as the outcome to their situation. Uh, they brought it in in Attica as an example, uh, just like in Wounded Knee. Uh, but in Attica, it backfired on them because most of, most of the National Guards that came in did not fire any guns. It was known that the state troopers and the police were the ones that fired the guns at us. You know, the, the National Guard did not play no role in that other than they didn't even understand the whole thing that was happening in the yard, the National Guard. As a matter of fact, some of them even came to uh, our, some of our trials after we got indicted and talked about supporting us. So we could see that the, 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 the difference between one situation and another. But nevertheless, the, the Army is an organ of the state. And we need to understand that that's what it is. It plays a role uh, to support and to maintain the power of the state. Uh, so that's basically one thing I wanted to say, man, you know, uh, on that. Right on. <laughs> Jinx. <laughs> Um, I was just going to add to what, well, first I wanted to add on the whole military thing and how even veterans are not safe. I have a question. Did y'all ever see that video about, about that soldier calling out Bush about the Iraq war? Did y'all, yes. did y'all see, see that yes. video? Did yes. you see it, Sister Sun? Yeah. Yeah, that shit right there, like you could hear the pain his fucking voice, realizing that they were fucking used to slaughter and kill and um, and colonize people who, who had nothing to do with 9-11, no. which was planned, by the way, which was planned, they had nothing to do with, 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 with 9-11. All of the countries that were colonized in West Asia, because again, fuck saying the Middle East, Every single country that was colonized in West Asia had nothing to do. We're not even had nothing to do with um with, with um with 9/11. And as you were saying, Shanti, the U.S. would literally use these soldiers as scapegoats to colonize, to oppress, to subjugate, to exploit, and to siphon colonized people both both within. And outside um, their borders, both 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 with internal colonies and external colonies. So so, and what ha and what typically happens when uh when when these soldiers come back, especially colonized soldiers, especially non-white soldiers, what, what happens to them? They get left behind. They get fucking uh they get fucking thrown out, um um tossed on the side of the road as if they, they were garbage. <laughs> Because you are only considered, you're you're only safe, you are only protected for as long as for as long as you are you are exploitable. But the moment you're no longer exploitable, the moment you can no longer uphold white supremacy, the interests of the bourgeois, and the contradictions of capitalism, the moment you are no longer eligible to um to continue the oppression um of the system. You get tossed to the side and left to die, like 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 you were like you were just, like you were sorry, like you were some stray dog. Right. It's fucking. No one's safe. No, no one's one safe. Is... You're 
you're only you're only safe for for as long as your for as long as your agency to, to capital remains with the bourgeois. That's it. That's, that's literally it. it. That's only <laughs> that that's only when you're con- con- um, uh, uh, con- considered safe and profitable to the bourgeois because because especially with with the military, um, as y'all already um as y'all most likely already know, there the, the military is becoming. I, it's be, is um 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 military troops and um and um, and operations are start are starting to be incorporated more and more by machines, and they're starting to incorporate fucking uh, drones, um and pretty soon, um yeah. and, and pretty soon whenever there'll be robots <laughs> fighting these wars, and so um and, um and so people you know there there there'll be there'll be machines doing the work. Um, of of these imperialists, so no one's safe. No one's yeah. safe from um of uh, uh from the system. Another thing that I wanted to add was um was um shit. I, I got bad memory. <laughs> so uh, uh so uh, so excuse me if I forget uh some things. But uh comrade uh comrade Shay, um I think I, I already mentioned this before, but I really think we should have a movie night. Um, to watch, um, to watch the Attica movie, I really think we should have, um, a, we, I really think we should have, a, we should have a movie night about that because understanding Attica and the situation that happened there is essential to understanding, um, to 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 understanding the the necessity of radicalizing not just not 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 just not just those outside, but those inside prisons as well of reaching out to them of of, of trying to radicalize them and, and and let them know that they're not alone in the struggle of liberation because i think because i think it was you che um who said that prisons are just are, are just little mini societies they're just little mini internal societies um as well so right on um on, on that note, yeah, like we definitely should do that. That's not something we would be able to air because of copyright laws and whatnot, but we can right. definitely gather together in Zoom and uh, I can screen share the movie. I do have access to it. It's on Showtime. Um, so I, I can screen share that so that, you know, we can all watch that together and Everybody here, you can invite your comrades from your various parties and other friends and whatnot, too, by all means. I think that would be a a really good thing to do. So that way, you know, we can actually have some in-depth conversation, especially being able to hear in more detail from you, Comrade Shea, about all the things that went down there and the forms of oppression that the state was using against you guys simply for speaking up for human rights, like proper food access to health care fucking yep. toilet paper toilet paper come on now there's there's so many ways that they were just violating the fuck out of you guys <laughs> they 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 deserve to be called out on that shit you know and it's it's a fabulous film i i watched it when you told me about it months ago and was just like holy fuck through the whole thing seeing the things you guys had to contend with there it speaks volumes about just how oppressive the state is, and especially towards those who are incarcerated. Check out our most recent, uh, our 52nd uh, memorial. It happened at Trinity Church downtown. That's where I was this, this past few days ago. And it, it, it turned out good. It was a lot of people there, and I spoke, and, and uh, other, other brothers spoke. You know, but it was definitely a good, a good reorganizing, re- reuniting of people. You know that haven't that haven't been we haven't been with for such a long time, and it seems like people are just leaving. You know, little by little. You know, but you still got a few old people like myself, <laughs> <laughs> like myself. <laughs> you know, You're awesome, Ah. <laughs> You know, some, awesome. 
<laughs> some mother said, some mother said, damn, Chad, you get oh, I said, yeah, but I, as long as Attica, as long as Attica it lives, I'm always going to be there for it. Fuck you. Know? Right. You know? right on. And the legacy, the legacy of Attica, man. You know, when you, when y'all see it, y'all gonna laugh. Y'all y'all not gonna laugh. Y'all gonna be sad. Y'all gonna cry. You know, because it's very it's very uh very touchy, man. Very touchy. But the one here, the one just reaching, I'm gonna try to find out how could it, we have access to it. You know, uh, and and, and I'll let, I'll let y'all know the deal. Right on. We are all out of time. That's right. We're we all, Attica. all Attica. Attica is all of us, and that's what I all. That's what I emphasize: the <laughs> fact that what happens to one in the outside happens to one on the inside. So they're both interrelated. People on the outside are interrelated to people on the inside. So in, in actuality, we all incarcerated. <laughs> <laughs> we really are. This country is a fucking open air prison. <laughs> it literally is. It literally is. It's just prison, but on the outside. That's all, that. That's that. That that's all it is. Where where the police guards are, are the prison guards. Where our prisons are, um, as Captain Africa puts it, um, the plantations that we work, that we work at. <laughs> um, uh, that makes- uh, a capitalist society is just like a prison because because both inside of a prison. Both inside of a prison and both outside of a capitalist society, you um you only have one thing left to give to these bourgeois bastards: your labor. That's your the labor. only thing you have. That's the only thing. That's the only thing they want to extract your labor and to and to use it to, to uphold their own ends, both in prison and outside. Because these fucking prisons were never meant for re- for rehabilitation, and anyone who still fucking says that shit is has been fucking lied to. Oh, well, that came there from were... my, that came from exactly. my people's oppression. It came from my ancestors' oppression. Okay, exactly. we were targeted first. We were the ones. To, we were the first ones to be targeted to what became the prison the the prison system and the police system. Okay, my ancestors, mine, mine. It's a long bloody history that is still happening. The U.S. is literally an open air prison, and many of us don't know that. We don't know that because we have been so brainwashed with thinking that this is the way things are. No, this is not the way things are. It's only been like that uh, for 531 years. So that's not true. And second of all, the fact that um, like it's it's literally a colony within a colony within a colony within a smaller colony. Like that's literally what it is. The schools, the prisons, uh, uh, the uh, workplaces, all of this stuff to give our labor to, to give these bourgeois people uh, even more access uh, uh, to our, to exploit us. Like that is literally, it's literally an open air death camp. If you want to know the truth. Yeah, when it really? comes down to, you know, if people want to call this land of the motherfucking free, excuse me, how it's free not- are you when your fucking choices are have your labor exploited to the extreme that you're barely surviving or just starve and fucking die out on the street? That's not fucking freedom. That's exploitation. That's open air prison and wage slavery. Plain and fucking simple. Um, Comrade Joe, I see you got your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I was going to say, um, as long as we don't become prisoners of our own mind, because society has us already imprisoned, but they should never take our mind. But we're, you know, dictated whether on the inside or the outside. Um, both both have been affected equally, uh, because even those that suffer so many years in prison still have mothers and children on the outs that do without them uh, because they have to. That's the way society has it. And society always tries to break us and, and, and keep us like down with that whole scare tactic of like, what, and once you get in the system, you it's so hard to get out of the system. I give much respect to those 
who had did years in prison and were able to get out and stay out of prison. Because it's a, a revolving door for most people and society has it that way. Um, so I, I think that's what I wanted to mention. There was something else, but damn, I always, always be patient and then I, oh, now I forget. But anyway, comrades. <laughs> Maybe the thought will boomerang back in a moment. <laughs> you never that's know. That's my ADHD. <laughs> that's my ADHD brain. <laughs> Well, no, because I think about 10 different things at the same time. And, and like, I mean, I'm not even paying attention to my phone. Like, that's another 20 things I need to pay attention to. But I, I, enjoy, I really enjoy these study groups and stuff. I'm like, all power to the people, comrades. Like, uh, revolutionary love uh, from Brother Joe all the way out here in Seattle, Washington. All power, comrade. Um. I want to um I just want to mention um um for Comrade Che um and to all of those um to all the revolutionaries who passed away in Attica, I want to say a quote from Che Guevara himself. <laughs> um it says right right here, uh wherever death may surprise us, it will be welcome, provided that this our battle cry reached some receptive ear that another hand stretched out to take up weapons and that other men come forward to entune our funeral dirge with the staccato of machine guns and new cries of battle and victory. You know, whenever I get depressed and whenever I think of all the revolutionaries who have passed away, who have been taken by the state, a Fred Hampton, G.P. Newton, Malcolm X, uh, Martin Luther King, and so on and so forth. Whenever I think of people who have been who have been obliterated and whitewashed and killed by this white supremacist system, I always I, I always read that quote to cheer me up because as Shay says right there, you know, um, you you may kill a revolutionary, but you never kill a you'll never kill the revolution. You can kill a revolutionary, but you can never kill um, um, ideas. So long as oppression exists, so long as there are people being exploited, oppressed, subjugated, so long as we, as we continue to live in this capitalist, imperialist system, there will always be revolutionaries. Because every single time the state oppresses someone, they're at risk of forming a deadly revolutionary. Whenever, whenever someone is imprisoned, whenever someone is harassed by the police, whenever someone is manipulated and coerced to engage in foul um, activities, they're, uh, yep, they, they're, at, they're at risk. Um, the bourgeois are risking potentially forming a deadly revolutionary be uh of forming a deadly revolutionary um a lot of the black panthers um if i if i if i if i remember correctly uh, um a lot a lot of the black panther members were revolutionized um by by being imprisoned if i um if i um if i if i remember correctly another thing i want to say was and i talked to you about this uh sister zen before is that something that pisses me off so much is when it um is is when people say well x people are more are more oppressed than x people i always fucking hate that because this isn't a fucking competition this isn't a fucking identity fucking um this is not ide identity politics to see who's the most fucked we're all fucked we're all oppressed we're all exploited the point the point is, isn't to, to debate and argue and have identity politics about 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 who's the most fucked. I mean, that's what the bourgeois want. They want they want us to fight amongst our, ourselves and never realize who the actual enemy is. We're all fucked. The point is to end fuckery for everyone. <laughs> that's the whole point. So yeah, all power, all power to the people. All power, cameras. All power. All power. Power. Um, I just looked at the clock and we are a little over two hours. So 
Um, if anybody has any thoughts to offer in conclusion here, we can do so and and then we'll uh, wrap things up. Oh, Juan Tab left. Um, I, I don't know who that was. <laughs> I think that was Johnny Torres. Oh, really? I, um, I wonder why he didn't say anything. I would love to hear um, what, one, of, one, of his mer one of his many poems. <laughs> okay. I, I think what it is is a lot of us are trained to just be quiet and listen. Um, right. And, but we can't have a conversation if everybody's just quiet and listening, right? Because what are you going to listen to? Your thoughts? Um, so, but anyway, um, oh, I was, I can't wait to comrade Chad, um, puts out that, uh, that video, man. I, I, I would love to see it and stuff like that. I see it too. Yes, they, um, <laughs> I was going to ask if somebody, um, ha how, how can I see that movie Attica? Um, if I don't have that, whatever Showtime or HBO stuff, um, I did. does somebody I did. have <laughs> Well, I, I've got link. Showtime, so we don't need to pirate it. But yeah, I just saw your note in the the Zoom chat. Um, I can't save a copy of it to be able to oh. like email it out or anything, but oh. I can share it from my computer because um, I've got Showtime logged in on here. So oh, then you if know, you screen wanna... share, oh, I can I can just watch it from there. Yeah, like if we get together in Zoom to do a movie night, then uh, I can just, you know, screen share the movie. Okay. Um, okay. So that way we can all watch it together and have a discussion. Oh, yeah. You know, that, that, that'd that be cool. I, I would love that. So, oh, that's all. That's what I want. That's what I forgot that I wanted to say. So looking forward to both of those. Thank you. Welcome. All right. Well, on that note, I guess we can wrap things up for this evening. Um, we'll see you back here in a couple of days for the, the next segment of this book. But all power, Panther Love. All power to the people. All power to the people. All power. All power. Stay strong, comrades. All, all revolutionary love and power. That's right. <laughs> I <do not> guess. <laughs>